Killer on a White Horse, a story of the Evening Watchman by Ned DeHaan. The audiobook, made available on Black Box Online Radio. Feel free to support this channel at buymeacoffee.com slash blackboxned88. Chapter 18 Yellow, said Barry. He placed Warren on speakerphone. Yellow to you, too, Warren returned. How's it going out on the strip? Sometimes Barry and Warren would refer to William's Pike as the strip. It's going, Barry tried to sound cool. Joanna, do you want to say hi? She shook her head, indicating no. Joanna, Warren asked. Um, hello, uh, you working with Barry today? I wouldn't call this work, she muttered sardonically. Yeah, well, we all got bills to pay, Warren pointed out. What's your name? Joanna asked. Warren Jones, he answered. What about you? Joanna Skite, she answered. Barry tensed for a second. This was the first time he heard Joanna's last name. He heard the name Emmanuel Inman many times, but this was the first time he heard Joanna say hers. A certain sense of jealousy came over Barry as he heard Joanna say her surname to Warren before telling him directly. Skite? Barry asked. Yes, Barry Albert, she went on. Someone once told me that my name is an Irish swear word. I never bothered to look it up, because I'm afraid it's false. I'd rather it be true. Warren laughed, and Barry did too, although Barry's laugh was fake. He began to rethink his choice to include Joanna on the call. At one second, he was high as a kite, thinking about how he was going to talk to his best friend and the new woman in his life. The next, he was consumed with envy, though Barry had to admit... He had created the situation. Anyway, Barry, I guess you want to know this too, Joanna, Warren started. There has been a lot of uh, talk about the White Horse Killer online. I mean, uh, Joanna or uh, Barry. Um... It's okay, Barry went on. You can say it. Barry told me that you know Robert Gallus, Warren asked. Yeah, golly, we call him that, she confirmed. Golly Gallus. But you know that he wasn't the White Horse Killer? Warren asked. If our info is true, he wasn't, Joanna went on. Well, not only the info, Barry interjected. We also spoke to Inman and Trista. They're being highly suspicious. Did you guys contact the police or something? Warren asked. Barry felt a warm wash of relief come over him when Warren started directing the questions toward both of them and not just Joanna. We did she almost roared. No one is listening. Anyway, we have people that have been sharing some stuff online, and what have they been saying, Warren? Barry asked. I've just been reading forums and like the comments sections, and of course, the articles. Warren kept going. I mean, of course, some of the articles are like from newspapers, but then they have their own comments sections. You gotta log on to the post if you want to read all the comments, and I don't have an account on some of the pages. So I just glance at them. I glance at the ones that um, have the bigger comment sections, and, you know, it's almost like doing math in your head sometimes. What? Barry snapped. Math? What are you, what are you talking about? I mean, what are they talking about? M math? Joanna also snapped a little. Yeah, Warren Hum. Like... There are these weird crypto messages or whatever, and they're all made of W's and V's and X's and O's. A lot of people think that that's a math puzzle. I mean, it is of sorts. I was reading this one guy's theory. I shouldn't say guy because it could be a woman. But they are saying that if you count up all of the W's, it will reveal the killer's identity. So people online don't think Golly did it? Joanna asked. Well, some do, some don't, Warren explained. Like... When some people are posting these theories on forums and such, some people are like, they caught the guy, his name is Robert Gallas, he's the white horse killer. Other people are not convinced. Of course, there's always the conspiracy nuts out there who are making stuff up, but they think that it's some type of shadow network, like the shadow network of cult-like activity or something, or maybe they say it's the CIA. What could the CIA have to do with this? Joanna pondered. Like, one of those ploys to change modern culture? That's all nonsense, Joanna grumbled. I mean, it's clear as day, isn't it? How do you mean? Barry asked. There is one guy, Joanna began. One murderer. 
He is targeting couples. A guy and a girl together. He is taunting the radio station WBBR. What number is it like? What, what did you say? 101.9. Around here, anyway, said Barry. I mean, it sounds like this is some sexually messed up pervert, Joanna elaborated. But none of the victims were sexually assaulted, Barry challenged her. Didn't you ever watch forensic shows or things like about unsolved mysteries, she challenged back. A serial killer can target victims in a sexual way without sexually assaulting them. Like, he gets off on the killing. He targets couples, romantic couples, because he's a bit of an antisocial reject. This white horse killer seems like a man who is angry because he didn't get the women that he wanted, so he's going after men and women together. I mean, like, he wants to, like, what's the word? Exert power over them exert but he definitely wants to dominate he wants to get off on dominating them domination or overtaking of a woman the man is just an obstacle he doesn't care about the men at all he kills them so he will have easier access to the women wow said warren those are some good ideas i mean it, it makes sense but then you think robert gallus is nothing like that golly doesn't have any trouble getting women Joanna almost snickered. Barry's jealousy hit a new green level. His blood almost boiled at the remark. He wasn't sure how he knew, but he was almost certain that Golly had been with Joanna in the past. The way she said the words, he knew. Barry bit his tongue, and he didn't want to think about that any more. He was focused on another thing. It wasn't some type of mathematical signature with the W's. It was the single killer. Barry couldn't escape that. There was something about Trista. He couldn't shake her from his mind. Barry couldn't pinpoint it, but he felt that Trista was more pertinent to the mystery than Manny. She knew more. She was more manipulative. Perhaps there was indeed a white horse killer. A man the way Joanna had described. But perhaps as well. Someone was behind the scenes, pulling his strings. Chapter 19 And always please like and subscribe. Barry and Joanna woke up to the sound of raindrops. The night had passed so quickly. Barry glanced at the smartphone. It was now 11 a.m. It seemed early for him. He almost always slept until noon. But he was glad to have been asleep. Joanna was next to him in bed. Her naked body was under the sheets. And as they slowly regained composure, he put his hand on her. She had washed her only outfit and hung it up to dry. Although she was in the nude... They had not made love the night before. Joanna said she was too tired. But Barry also knew that she was upset with him. When Todd, the true night watchman, had come by at midnight to take over the shift, Barry had told Joanna to hide in the trees across the street. He did not have to explain himself as to why he did not want Joanna with him. Joanna begrudgingly agreed without hearing the explanation or wanting it. Want some coffee? Or like a diet soda or something? Barry asked Joe. There was no response. Was she still mad? What's wrong? Barry asked her. Joanna moved herself into a more seated position with the bedsheet and blanket hiding her upper body. The first feeling I had this morning, she began. The I... This isn't my home. It's your home. Your motel room, anyway. I've been here for two years, Barry pointed out. I think of it as home now. Well... Where is my home? Joanna asked. Barry moved closer to the small black mini fridge and picked up a diet cola. Are you sure you don't want one? he asked. I've been on the road for nearly a year, she continued. But this is the first time when I felt like, like, I don't have a home. We always moved from place to place, and it never seemed like an issue. Now, Trista and Manny are, well, I don't know about them. Golly is in jail. I don't even have my backpack. It feels like the only things I have that are mine are those wet clothes. And the only place I have is this half of a mattress. Barry pondered the meaning of it. Part of him felt uneasy. He felt uneasy because of Joanna's own uneasiness. However, at the same time, there was a feeling of exhilaration in knowing that Joe felt like she belonged on her half of the mattress. Yes her half. Hey, look, Joe, 
Barry started. What do you need? Well, some new clothes wouldn't hurt, she answered. Barry's feeling of exhilaration somehow vanished. But all of a sudden, an idea came to mind. His lips formed into a flat smile. What are you thinking about? Joanna asked. Hey, Joe, he said. Why don't you make the coffee? I need to call someone about something. Sure, darling, she retorted almost sarcastically. Barry put on a white t-shirt and a pair of red basketball shorts over his boxers and slipped into a pair of Nike flip-flops and moved out into the light rain. He didn't need an umbrella because the rain wasn't too heavy. Then he moved to the gazebo in the center of the motel property and dialed a number on his phone. Twenty minutes later, Blaze arrived. She pulled up in a white Ford Mustang. It was an older model, but it was a car that Barry had never seen her drive before. Hey, Barry called to her. Blaze exited the car and walked over to the gazebo picnic table. Yellow, she mocked him. Did you bring the strawberry card? Barry asked her. Yeah, she replied. Well, Barry, I do you're not going to offer me a drink or invite me in? We have a lot to talk about. No, we don't, he defended. What do you mean? she asked. How much is on the strawberry card? How much is left? he asked her. About uh, one thousand nine hundred dollars, she answered. Why, Barry, what's going on? Here's the deal, Blaze, he tried not to grin. You're going to give me the card, then you're going to drive out of here. Blaze started to laugh. And why on earth would I do that? She scuffed. Because what you did was illegal, he spoke firmly. Either you give me the strawberry card, or you go to jail. Are you out of your mind? She roared. I'm not giving you anything. Barry reached for his phone and began to push buttons. Wait, Barry, she sneered. Wait, this is crazy. Can't we talk about this? This is a payment for trying to involve me in this little fraud scheme. Barry barked at her. You said so yourself. It's like creating money out of thin air. You involved me? $1,900 is my payment for the risk. The situation you put me in. Now you can give me the card, and you can drive away. You are crazy, she shouted. I know, but so are you, he almost laughed. Look, Blaze. You can just get a new one the next time you're at work. It's no real loss to you. You give me the card, I stay quiet, and I'll never ask you for one again. Never again. You have my word. You dragged me out here for this, she moaned. This isn't a request. Barry spoke even more firmly. It's blackmail. Now set the strawberry card down on this table, and we will be done with this. You're just going to get a new one the next time you're on the job. It doesn't cost you anything. So, now I, she began, put the card down on the table, he ordered, or you're going to jail. I have a chocolate card and a vanilla card, she revealed. The chocolate card is worth $500. The vanilla is worth 1000 Here, look. She reached into her purse and pulled out the chocolate card. It was almost identical to the pale strawberry, except that it was a light brown. The vanilla card was not right, but rather a darker beige. The chocolate card was still in its gift card packaging. On the package was the image of a blue box with a matching blue ribbon and a bow tied in the corner. Look, you can have the chocolate card, she answered. It's brand new. I haven't spent a cent. It's active. It's worth five hundred dollars. I give you the vanilla, but I, I've been spending from it. It now has less than five hundred dollars. Barry knew when Blaze was lying. He knew she had a vanilla card. That was probably worth more than 500 But it didn't matter. Okay, he confirmed. Wow, really? She sounded. Yeah, really, Barry answered in the same tone. $500, he thought out loud and even said the words. He reached over and picked up the package of the chocolate card. $500 he repeated. That is fine. I'm not greedy. This also seems fair. A fair price to stay quiet about this. You are weird, Barry, Blaze muttered. And you just paid this weirdo five hundred dollars, he countered. But Blaze, yeah? If you can do what you say you can, 
Barry started. Well, you're dealing with a lot of money. I know, she gloated. Aren't you worried about getting caught? Barry asked her. No, Blaze rejected the idea flatly. Sooner or later, someone is going to find out about this, he provided. What's it to you? Blaze shrieked. If I go down, you go down. You took that chocolate pout. I'm taking you down with me. That was the trade-off. Fuck you, Barry, she shrieked again. Why, he defended. You can just get another chocolate card any time you want. Yeah, she sneered. I don't ever want you to do this again. I already said I wouldn't, Barry explained. That's the deal. Don't ever talk to me again, Blaze erupted. She turned and quickly flung open the door to her Ford Mustang. Blaze, Barry called to her. Blaze left the door to the white Ford Mustang opened and walked back. Don't get another chocolate card, Barry suggested. Once you've spent all of the vanilla, don't get another one of those either. Only use the strawberry card. You can go to the money center at the supermarket. Uh, Food City is the best. They will show you how to move the funds from the strawberry card to your bank account. If you use one card, it will look less suspicious. Oh, th thanks, she said sincerely, but in a surprised way. Blaze turned and left. Then Barry got up and walked back to room 8703 at the Birch Park. He turned the key in the lock and noticed that the rain had gone away. It smells like coffee in here, he said to Joe, who was sitting on the edge of the bed. He pulled her close to him and gave her a powerful kiss on the lips. I got you the money to go shopping, Barry explained. Oh? Joanna sounded blankly. What? Barry glowed. I thought you'd like it. I have something for you, too, she answered. Joanna pulled away from Barry and walked toward the table in the motel room. Barry saw a handwritten note on the motel writing pad. 515, 2 by 2 by 2 by 2 Where was White Horse? Who raised the four white horses of Abraxas? Where was Cooper's white horse from the Book of Rev? Why was there a black beauty, a black stallion but not a white? The White Horse Killer. WWVV WW zero zero WWXX WWVV zero zero. It's the message that the White Horse Killer mailed to the radio station, Barry identified. The line at the end, said Joe. Yeah, Barry encouraged her to continue. I solved it. I solved the code, she revealed. Chapter 20 Joanna stood an inch away from Barry. She looked beautiful, as she always did. Barry was still high on getting the upper hand in the discussion with Blaze. To be honest, Barry wanted nothing more than to throw Joanna into the sheets and romp, but there was something else that had taken over. Joanna showed Barry the notes on the stationary pad. 515. Two by two by two by two. Where was White Horse? Who raised the four white horses of Abraxas? Where was Cooper's White Horse from the Book of Rev? Why was there a black beauty, a black stallion, but not a white? The white horse killer. But where's the solution to the code? Barry asked. WWVVWW00WWXXWWVV00, Joanna read off. They're all arranged in pairs. There are 18 letters, and the W is the signature of the white horse killer. I don't think it's more than that. The numbers and symbols here... D numbers? Yes, the number zero. I thought it was an O at first, but those are not O's. They are zeros. Look how ovular they are. Almost elongated. Anyway, I don't think that that's much of an importance. Nine letters and numbers, each doubled. I think the white horse killer, um, the uh, real one, not golly, has his initials with the 18th letter of the alphabet and the ninth letter of the alphabet. The eighteenth and the ninth letters of the alphabet are R and I, or let's reverse it. The ninth letter is I, and the eighteenth letter is R. Eighteen symbols divided by two. I don't know everything about people, but one thing I've noticed is people like to hide in plain sight. Edgar Allan Poe taught us that with the purloin letter. People who send codes usually have a very simple solution. I mean, I don't know too many people who send in codes, but if I did, this is how I expect they would do it. I don't want to be rude, but... Barry thought silently. 
What about the number two at the top? Barry asked. I mean, the two by two by two and so on. The White Horse Killer targets couples, Joanna started. I think that is the most obvious. There are five of them. Either he has killed ten people or he is planning to kill ten people. Joe, said Barry. A chill began to overtake Barry as he pondered something. What is it? she asked nervously. What's Trista's last name? Why? Joanna asked back. What is it? Barry inquired again. Joanna grew wide. Richards, she answered. Richards. Richards and Inman, Barry revealed. R and I, or I and R, either way. No, Joanna protested. Hey, I, Barry tried to say. No, Barry, she cut him off. That's not what I meant by this. I... She sat down on the bed, and Barry could see that she was nervous. She stumbled onto something she had not wanted to find. Barry sat next to her. I didn't mean that. That's not it, Joanna kept protesting. I mean, that is something like a coincidence. I, Trista couldn't. I mean, you said you had it better than anyone. We were together at 5.10, then 5.15. We couldn't. I mean, they couldn't. It's just, it's not it. It's true, Barry concurred. It's true. Look, Joe, I didn't mean to sound like that. It's impossible. It's just a coincidence. There is no way that... Manny and Trista could have been involved with that murder. If Golly didn't do it, you were with them. I saw you with them. They had nothing to do with the murder. I don't know if my solution to the puzzle is even right. Maybe you are, though, Barry contributed. A lot of names for guys begin with R. Not only Richard, but what about Robert? Robert Gallus? Joanna murmured. See, another coincidence. Barry revealed. I doubt it, but Richards, Roberts, lots of names. It could all be a coincidence, and it couldn't be meaning Robert Gullis and Trista Richards. Yeah, couldn't be, said Joanna. Perhaps there's a guy out there named Ronald Hinsbrook or Ike Richmond, Barry proposed. Ike? <laughs> Joanna laughed. A serial killer named Ike? I like Ike, but Ike doesn't like you? Barry laughed, too. But look, that card over there has $500. Today we will get you some new clothes and all the stuff. His arm moved around Joanna, their eyes locked. Then they fell back together on the white sheets. Chapter 21 Barry was back at the job site, watching a magnificent sunset. August was a miserable month during the day. But during the evenings and the nights, it created one of the best times of the year. Barry sat alone in the red Mazda, still holding the copy of Candide by Voltaire, and still not reading it. He couldn't focus on the book, for now there were two things that were always on his mind. The White Horse Killer and Joanna. Sweet Joe. He missed the touch of her already. He missed having her at the job site, even though yesterday she had been so miserable there. He still preferred to have her by his side as opposed to the empty seat, with the bottles of iced coffee and diet cola. Joanna had refused to join him at the job site, and instead he left her alone in the motel room with the chocolate card. The plan was for Joanna to walk to some nearby stores before sunset, buy whatever items she needed. It almost felt like life was falling into place for Barry, except for the fact that he had met Joanna with Inman, Trista, and Golly. He knew that he had not seen the last of them. Barry didn't trust Joanna. He wanted to trust her, but he didn't yet. He could trust her with the motel room. He had trust her with using his laptop. He had nothing to hide. She might find some old photos with Blaze, but that would pass over. The problem was that Barry had found Joe at such an awkward time. Some way, somehow, Inman and Trista were going to play a larger role in this. Barry knew it. He was growing rather fond of Joe, but he strongly disagreed with her assessment of the White Horse Killer's puzzle. Barry put down the book by Voltaire and picked up a copy of the solution that Joe had created to the code. WWVV WW00 WWXX WWVV00 18 divided by 2 is 9, Barry thought silently. There had to be something else. Barry believed that Manny Inman 
was nothing more than a dud, a goon, a flowery-talking bozo, a loser who spun circles, a bum again. There was no depth to Manny in Barry's eyes. There was nothing in special about him. The eyes he wanted to lock with were Trista Richards. He knew she was involved with something. At the very least, she gave the impression that she had a secret agenda. Barry had spoken to Warren earlier that day, and Warren had shared some new info about the White Horse Killer's message, the one beginning with 515, and continuing on with the 2 by 2 by 2s The next line was, where was White Horse? Who raised the four white horses of Abraxas? Where is Cooper's white horse from the Book of Rev? Why was there a black beauty, a black stallion, but not a white? The white horse killer, followed by the final line of code. According to what Warren called Professor Searchpar, Abraxas was a demon, or possibly an Egyptian mythological figure, that rode in a chariot driven by four white horses. Although Abraxas in the message was written with a U instead of an A, for some reason, it was spelled incorrectly. Cooper's white horse was from a writer that Barry had never heard of named William Cooper, who had written a book called Behold a Pale Horse in the 1990s. The title was a reference to the Book of Revelations and the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Black Beauty and the Black Stallion were, of course, literary and film references. Barry had seen the movies. He thought Black Beauty was a novel, but he couldn't remember if the Black Stallion was a novel first or not. Of course, the first line was, Where was White Horse? Warren said a lot of people had been talking about that because they believed the killer was from the Yukon in Canada. The capital of the Yukon Territory was White Horse. Barry did not believe that himself. He expected that there was someone much closer to the area near Williamsport, Maryland. What was Trista Richards doing in all of this? Barry's eyes caught a quick glance at the message at the end of the White Horse Killer's note. WWVV, WW00, WWXX, WWVV, 00. He then divided it into pairs. Next, he tried to rearrange them into groups. Barry picked up the notepad and threw it down. He was getting frustrated. He did not believe that the message was arbitrary. He did not believe that it had no meaning. But he couldn't figure out what the White Horse Killer was trying to share. There was always the possibility that the White Horse Killer was not sharing a name, but a different piece of information in the puzzle. Oh my God, said Barry aloud. Eight W's, four V's, four zeros, two X's. Eight, four, four, two. Eight plus four plus four plus two equals eighteen. The number eighteen appeared again. Barry couldn't believe it. Was Joanna right? Even if it meant that they weren't supposed to look for the numbers 9 and 18, it was a strange coincidence. 42 was also half of 84. 18 divided by 2 was 9. Perhaps Joe was right, indeed. R and I, Barry whispered to no one, Richards and Inman. Chapter 22 It was 15 minutes after midnight. Barry pulled into his usual parking space at the Birch Park. He saw the light on in room 8703, peeking through the curtains. That gave him comfort. But Joanna was still home. He had given her a $500 gift card and the key to the motel room. Part of him almost expected that she would not be there when he showed up, but for the first time in two years he knocked on the door. Even Blaze had never been there waiting for him when he had come home. She had her own home. Barry? Joanna called. Yeah, it's me, he answered. The door opened, and there was Joanna, wearing nothing but a white kitchen apron. Barry took a second glance, and he could see that that was, in fact, something on underneath. It appeared to be a set of black lingerie. Barry hurried inside and closed the door. Joe, he said. I got some new things at the store nearby. It took like an hour to walk to the shopping center down the road. But I found this, she made a presentation gesture regarding the apron. I know you already had dinner, she kept going. Sandwiches from the shop, right? Yeah, said Barry flatly. Well, I bought you an all-in-one cooking pot. It was a little hard to carry all this stuff all the way down, but I didn't mind. Now you can cook at home. And I went to the shop down here by the gas station, 
Did you know they sell coconut milk? I bought a bag of rice, too. That's the thing, um, that's over there in the purple bag. And I even found bananas. I thought about making mango rice, but they don't sell mangoes at the gas station. Thank the Lord. Barry's eyes moved around the motel room. He saw numerous bags. He had been gone for eight hours, but he didn't realize how much shopping she could have accomplished in that time. The idea of having a beautiful woman wearing only an apron and a set of black lingerie who was making him a dessert, if banana rice counted as a dessert, might have been one of Barry's wildest fantasies. However, he couldn't explain the sense of discomfort that fell over him. You bought a lot of stuff, he kept talking in a flat voice. Joanna leaned forward and kissed him. Now, let's have banana rice, she said. By the way, the chocolate cart is great. I've never heard of these things. Did you say that they sold them at Mega Dollar? Yeah, Mega Dollar, Barry concurred. What's wrong? Joe asked him. Nothing's wrong, Barry denied. Well, let's have banana rice, she cheered in a soft way. Then, <laughs> you need a shower. Joe, how much is left on the chocolate card? Barry asked. No idea, she laughed. You bought a lot of stuff. Joanna removed two plates from one of the bags and a wooden spoon that almost looked like carbonized bamboo. But it couldn't be real bamboo. At least Barry thought that it wasn't. But it had been another one of Joanna's purchases. Joanna put the banana rice on the plates and Barry sat down. He couldn't imagine what was wrong. Joe had done exactly what he had asked her to do. He had wanted her to go shopping, he had given her the money out of thin air car to buy the things, and she had done just that. She looked so beautiful in front of him, she even made him a light summer dessert, if banana rice counted as a dessert. I think something is wrong, Barry, said Joanna. No, Barry retorted. Nothing is wrong, in fact. I think, for the first time in a long time, things are just fine. Barry moved closer to Joanna and kissed her. You're welcome, she almost celebrated. Thanks for the banana rice, said Barry. After the dessert, which was surprisingly good, Barry showered and found Joanna without the apron. She was waiting for him on the bed. They had made love once before during the day, but Barry didn't mind doing it again. Do you want to watch some TV? she asked. Not <laughs> right now. Barry laughed gently. Good, she replied. I've been watching TV for hours. I've been waiting to be with you all day. Barry closed his eyes. He waited to feel a kiss from Joanna's vicious lips. However, he would not. Both Joanna and Barry were startled. Shards of glass flew across the motel room. A wave of glass. Fragments began crashing down upon them. Barry wrapped Joe in his arms and tried to pull her off the bed. They were halfway to the bathroom when they regained composure. What the hell was that? Joanna shouted. I, I don't know, Barry whispered. Let's get the slippers from the bathroom. There's glass everywhere. Well, that doesn't sound very heroic, Barry thought silently. Let's get the slippers from the bathroom. Joanna grabbed one of the white motel towels and wrapped it around her body. They looked up at the broken glass. Then they gazed down upon the floor and saw seven rocks. Barry counted seven, but there could have been more. Each rock was almost the size of a brick, and they all had notes secured to them, tied with an orange ribbon. Barry waited for a second, then he and Joanna moved closer to the projectiles. Barry reached down and picked up one of the rocks. As quickly as he could, he undid the ribbon and pulled off the paper note. Elizabeth, Barry read aloud. Who's Elizabeth? Joanna sounded. Uh, I don't know, Barry replied. They grabbed the other rocks and removed the notes. Look, Joanna shrieked. It says, Joanna skite. The note on the rock read. They kept removing the notes and found all seven. It didn't take long to find one that said, Barry Albert. Another one said, Stole. Another one said, And. And one said, Tong. Barry placed the notes in an order he thought was correct. Barry Albert stole Elizabeth Tong and Joanna Skite. Who's Elizabeth? Joanna shouted with more furiousness.